the Bible telling us that uh, those that believe in Jesus, they will rise from the dead. Though if he die, he will live. That's what Jesus said. I would like to read Bible verse in Revelation chapter 21, verse 5. And he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said unto me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. All things new. That's what Bible telling us. New heart, new mind, new spirit. That's what God wishes to bestow upon each and every one of, you, of us. And that comes from a new covenant. But this two precious souls, they're going to make that new covenant to Jesus Christ and to accept him as, the, as their personal savior and as their leader in their life. Okay. And the word of God telling us about ceremony that symbolizes that. And this is baptism. Baptism, this is ceremony that Christians perform all over the, the world and every single denomination, Christian denominations, perform baptism. Roman Catholic Christians, Eastern Orthodox Christians, Protestant Christians, everyone before baptism. This is this is the official uh, official uh, ceremony through which uh, we are joining the church. We become a member of the church, members of the church. So basically, this is about the wash. Symbolize washing away of sins. There was a man in the history who spent a fortune uh, for a special ceremonial wash that was a Buddhist religion. His name was Rama the Fourth, King of Zion. It's country today known as a, as a Thailand. He spent he spent five hundred thousand US dollars. Make a special baton for his 10 years old son to have ceremonial wash. And according to their, their customs, that can be used only once. Never again and by nobody else. Just for this young man. And he was ready to, okay, he was a king. He had the money. But that's besides the point, he spent a fortune for that. So he valued that ceremonial. I believe we all value this wash that we are going to do today, although the water is not so clean. And this wash is much more expensive than that what this man spent for his uh, son. But it has been paid and it has been provided for you and me free. So for two of you, it's free of charge. But it has been, <coughs> it has been paid a great price. Son of God, <coughs> so keep that in your mind, my dear. Candidates for baptism, keep that in your mind that as you are going down into the water to, to accept the baptism and to become a member of the church, keep that in mind that Son of God personally paid a great price. And he valued to you so much that he died for you. And keep in mind that if there was nobody else on this planet but two, two of you, he would die for you. So this is something that we all should keep in mind. It was for many, for many years. We should keep that in mind. Today is a joy in heaven. Jesus Christ is sleeping, but there is a joy in heaven. Uh, so we got me across my dear delegation here and with you especially as we are going now to perform this uh, baptism by immersion. It is uh, uh, seven of uh, forms of baptism that we are doing by immersion because this is the really, really, really. Jesus Christ was baptized in the Lord of the Lord. 
Our God and Father which art in heaven, in the name of our Savior and Redeemer, Jesus Christ, we come this very day, first day of the week, beside the Humber River, along with uh, the brethren, visitors, and uh, the most important one, with the candidates for baptism. Lord, we ask you now that as they will step in the water, when the old man will be immersed and will die, that they will be risen to a new life, that they will open a new page, a clean, white, pure in their lives. Please uh, bless Pastor Walter, uh, Orville and Rhoda, as they are making this covenant public, publicly, as you have commanded us to do. Help them, encourage them, and take them under your care, Lord. We ask that everything might be according to your will and impress our hearts and minds that we would follow you willingly and in love. In Jesus' name, we ask you to be our guests and to bless this special sacrament. Amen. 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 So now we have can sing the first stanza. I see the crimson wave, which is 530, and we will go to the <laughs> professional faith in Jesus Christ as a personal Savior. I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. as your personal Savior. I do baptize you in the name of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Wow, yeah. Amen. 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 <laughs>
Dear brothers and sisters, we have witnessed two brave people who went into this water and just received the Christian baptism by immersion. I'm very delighted to witness with, together with you and to see that they are willingly going in this water in faith in Jesus Christ as a personal savior. And at this time, we would like to just offer a short prayer to thank God for giving us this wonderful day after the rain, that he gave us even some sunshine and this blessed hope in the merits of Jesus Christ as our savior. Jesus came out of the water and the Holy Spirit came upon him and he prayed. We will pray here at the bank of this river. Let us kneel down and you can stay. Most gracious and loving Father in heaven, we thank you so much that you gave us opportunity this morning to come to this river and to and these two precious souls, Orwell and Rhoda, Brother Orwell and Sister Rhoda, to come here in the faith of Jesus Christ as their personal Savior, that they have surrendered their lives to you, Lord, to be members of thy kingdom, of the kingdom of God on earth, to be also members of thy church. Lord, I thank you that you have led them in their lives, that you have blessed them, that you have given Rhoda a godly family and a godly influence. And also, I thank you, God, for Orville, Brother Orville, whom you have led by thy Holy Spirit to this point, through many trials and tribulations. But Lord, he came here to profess that he believes in the blood of Jesus and in the power of resurrection. May that power of resurrection be present in their lives. May you bless them, Lord. May you bless us all. May you bless our youth, our families, and those who yet need to make the covenant with you, Lord. Give us thy peace and guide us as we make further steps. We go to the church to fellowship with these brethren. Lord, thank you for everything and that you gave us even sunshine this morning, Lord. May the sunshine of thy grace and love be always with us all the days of our life. We thank you and praise thy holy name in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. We will change, brethren. You can sing one or two more hymns, and then we will gather again at the church for fellowshipping. Just a few words. Yes. When Jesus was baptized, there is a record in the Bible when he was baptized while he was praying, heavens, heaven was open, and Holy Spirit came upon him. And don't think that two, two of you are anything different. Heaven is open <coughs> today for two. Amen. 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 First with us and then with you.
I wouldn't trust my wife. I wouldn't feel the same unless I made a promise to her and she to me several years ago. And many of you who have were married and made that promise. So likewise, God says, I hate divorce. God hates breaking up the covenant. But God loves us, he invites us to make the covenant. When we make a covenant with God, this is a very serious thing. And you know, God always wanted to be in a covenant relationship with his people. And Bible history, we are told that he invited one man by the name of Abraham and called him out and proposed to make a covenant with him. And in Genesis 17, 7, he told him, I will establish my covenant between me and you and your offspring after you throughout their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and to your offspring after you. Isn't that a wonderful promise? I will be your God. I will make an everlasting covenant with you. And not only with you, with your offspring, your descendants. And then, when his offspring was in bondage in Egypt, what did God say in Exodus 2.24? And God heard the, their groaning, and God remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob. So you see, God is the covenant keeper. God makes a promise, he remembers the promise. And he remembered the covenant he made with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And now when they are coming to Mount Sinai, God is making covenant with the whole nation of Israel. So I'm Jewish rabbi, I said very interesting things, that for many religions in the world there is some special messenger, some person to whom God appeared somewhere, who knows where, declared some secret knowledge, and then he comes down and tells the people, well, God appeared to me and told me this and that. He said, with us Jews, it's not like that. There were two million people hearing God speaking. So Moses did not come up down from hill and say, well, God appeared to me. They saw the mountain shaking. God was speaking in a special way. So biblical religion is not just some corner. You know, this was a, no one ever questioned that God appeared to the Jews. And made a covenant with them. And look what God said in Exodus 19, 4 to 6. You have seen what I did to the Egyptians, and how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now therefore, if you obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession out of all the peoples. Indeed, the whole earth is mine, but you shall be for me a priestly kingdom and a holy nation. These are the words that you shall speak to the Israelites. Now, you see, to enter into covenant with God, there are a few things you have to do, and I have to do, and you have to do, and you have done. The first is obey my voice. Obey my voice. Obedience to God's voice will be the test which Israel would demonstrate to the world that he trusted God and it will live according to his words. But then God says, if you obey my voice and keep my covenant. So the covenant is in that special provision. So the demands of the covenant were the laws and statutes that regulated the relationship between Israel and God. You see, covenant is an agreement between at least two parties. One party stipulates, has conditions and terms, and the other party, there are mutual obligations and benefits. So, what was the subject of the covenant? Ten commandments. God says, these are the words that you will keep. And if they keep it on that condition, God said, you shall be my treasure possession. Was Israel God's treasure possession? Absolutely. He redeemed them from Egypt. They were slaves. He, he gave ransom from them. He redeemed them from slavery. First commandment, I am the Lord thy God. Who, what? 
brought you out of slavery. See, it's a powerful statement in the Ten Commandments. What God does for us. So we, if you keep the covenant, if you keep the commandments, you are treasure possession. He purchased you. He redeemed you. He saved you. Second, God said, you shall be for me a priestly kingdom, which means a servant nation. Servant nation. The whole earth is mine, but you are special. Likewise today, brothers and sisters, seven Adventists, foreigners, are God's special treasure possession. The fifth testimony, with the mighty clear of the truth, with the message of the first, second, and third angel, God had separated. Modern Israel, as he separated ancient Israel, we are special people, treasure possession, servant nation, priestly role to serve today. If you read in Isaiah 461, 6, it says, you shall be prophets of saying, reminding them of that plan of God. You shall be called priests of the Lord. You shall be named ministers of our God. Yesterday in Sabbath school we mentioned about that. We all are preachers. We all are ministers. This is Protestant belief in the common priesthood. All believers. We don't have human priests. We have Jesus Christ as the high priest. And we are all priests in that way. We are ministering to others. We are ambassadors for God. And the third, God says, you shall be a holy nation. Holy nation. What does it mean to be holy? Two things. One is set apart for a special purpose. And second thing, this is ethical, moral, body. There is something that is of value in you if you are holy. God makes you holy. Now we know the Sabbath commandment. Only holy people can keep the Sabbath holy. So you see, we have to be made holy. Be therefore holy because I am holy, God says, right? So you are a holy nation. You shall be a holy nation. This is sanctification. And what was the response of the people? Everything that the Lord has spoken, we will do. Exodus 19.8. And that was a ceremony that covenant was ratified. It was in blood applied. And then there was a communion meal. They had a meal with God. And look at what people responded. Exodus 24, 3. Moses came and told the people all the words of the Lord and all the ordinances. And all the people answered with one voice and said, All the words that the Lord has spoken, we will do. Now I don't have to repeat what Brother Peter told us yesterday and spoke so eloquently. You know, we will do. And you say, we will do. You promised yesterday, right? Today you are baptized. But I want to tell you one thing. There is a problem, a big problem, when people say, we will do. Unless they understand what it means. God's commandments are holy, as God is holy. And you cannot keep the commandments unless God keeps the commandments in you and through you, right? And this was the problem of Israel. They were saying, we will do it. We will keep the commandments. We will do whatever the Lord promised. But what happened? We heard. Golden cup. Unfaithfulness. Breaking the covenant. And this is to make the long story short. God promises. Prophets are coming and reminding them of the covenant and telling them, bringing them, calling them back to the covenant faithfulness, you know. And then God finally promises in Jeremiah 31. Interesting statement from, I'm reading actually quoting, this is, let me tell you, this is the longest Old Testament quotation in the New Testament. The longest Old Testament text quoted in the New Testament is in Hebrews 8, quoting directly from Jeremiah 31. Promise of the New Covenant. And reading from verse 7 in Hebrews 8. For if that first covenant had been faultless, then should no place have been sought for the second. For finding fault with them, he said, Behold, the days come, said the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. 
not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, because they continued not in my covenant, and I regarded them not, said the Lord. And now the promise. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after these those days, say the Lord. I will put my laws into their mind and write them in their heart, hearts, and I will be to them a God, and they shall be to me a people. And they shall not teach every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for all shall know me from the least to the greatest. And look at this closing text. For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness, and their sins and their iniquities will I remember no more. This is the new covenant. This is the covenant the Apostle Paul quotes in Hebrews 8, telling what God promises to do. You see, this is the new covenant. God promises to do something what you cannot do. But your work is to surrender by faith. <coughs> Save Jesus Christ and say, God, I cannot do it. But you can do it. And this happens in, in Ezekiel 36, the 26 says, and a new heart also I will give you, and a new spirit will I put within you. And I will, I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh, and I will give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you, and cause you to walk in my statutes, and you shall keep my judgments and do them. So this is the promise, God's promise, what He will do, that He will cause you to walk in His statutes. He will put His Spirit in you. He will enable you. This is enabling grace. You heard it yesterday. There is a forgiving grace, pardoning grace, covering the sins. But grace also means enabling grace, giving you power to do the will of God. And this is the new covenant. This is 1888 message. And we enjoyed so much hearing this message this weekend. And I want this to stay with you when you make covenant with God, that you understand clearly what is the new covenant. That God will write in your heart and mind with His Spirit, His laws, and make you, cause you to do it, to keep it. And let me just quote one more Bible text. First Peter 2.9. See, but God didn't change from Old Testament to New Testament. People are saved the same way. God's plans have not changed for His people. Another Old Testament quote in 1 Peter 2 9 from Exodus. But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, that you should show forth the praises of Him who had called you out of darkness into His marvelous light. Do you agree with that, Lord? I know that you agree. You told us the darkness. And when I preach last Sabbath and I ask, is it hard to get to heaven? Is God's way hard? And we agreed. It's hard to go against God, right? It is difficult to kick against the tricks, against the goats. It is difficult to do your own will. But God can deliver you, right? Mighty deliverance. Now, Rhoda is in a different category. She has not thanked God, and that's a benefit and blessing, Rhoda, and all the young people who are sitting here today. She has made a good choice, the best choice that a young person can make at a young age to give her life to Jesus Christ. She will never regret that, I can guarantee you. Praise God for dedicated work of your parents and uh, all those who have influenced you positively. You have made a good decision. And Orville, it's not too late. Coming fully back to the Lord. Praise God for that. God loves to save the sinners, right? And Apostle Paul says, I am the first. I am the chief. That is what we have witnessed today. And I want to tell you what God promises. It's a beautiful promise. God is very serious about his business of saving people. We have the, from the spirit of prophecy a powerful statement. When you are baptized, the Father, you are baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And all three promise to aid you 
to help you. Let me read. Letter 12, 1901. This is one sentence. The Godhead was stirred with pity for the race, and the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit gave themselves to the working out of the plan of redemption. And one more, Manuscript 11, 1901. God says, come out from among them and be separate and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you and will be a father unto you, and you shall be my sons and daughters, said the Lord God Almighty. This is the pledge of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit made to you if you will keep your baptismal vow and touch not the unclean thing. God is making a vow to you today, promising that He will be faithful. He will work on your salvation. And you are entering into the membership of the church, the body of Christ. Not only relationship with God, but you are also related to others who have connection and work to do. And I know that God will use you. We welcome you today in the membership of the church. I will not go further. I would just say that I'm so happy that we have today witnessed our baptism. And I pray that God and the whole church will do their own work, embracing you, loving you, helping you, and that you on your part becoming a part of that body. You know, I don't have time to read, but just one, one, one final thought. You know, the church, the ultimate purpose of salvation is that Jesus will have a bride. Right? And the fine linen is prepared for her to dress, right? See, the great message of righteousness by faith that is so excellently expected, laid out in the, book, in, the, in the book of Romans. We often focus on the first eight chapters of Romans about justification by faith, sanctification, and all these wonderful truths. And we often overlook chapters 9 to 11. But there, in chapters 9 to 11, Apostle Paul brings to conclusion, to the apex, he finishes the building. He says, ultimately, through grace, through Jesus Christ, God's ultimate plan was fulfilled that both Jews and Gentiles are together one body. This is, this is the glorious truth. Gospel has accomplished its purpose, its objective. The both, the wall of separation is broken in Ephesians, Galatians. And we are one through Jesus Christ. This is what God planned for the Israel to do. And ultimately it will be fulfilled to the church. So you are becoming part of the church and fulfilling God's plan. May God give you His grace and help you to accomplish this to the very end. It's my mission prayer. Amen. Before we welcome, uh, fellowship you, we would have like to present a musical item. I think by children or by youth? Who is first? First, go children. First, children, and they will sing the song. What a friend we have in Jesus. What a friend. This is one of the favorite songs of our uh, organ. That's your favorite song. So children, please come forward and sing this beautiful song as a tribute to our brother Bobby. Bring your uh, hymn books with you. You can bring hymn books.
for Rodan. And this song is Rodan? For all the ages. 111. Wonderful. What, what beautiful creation is. Thank you, 
May God bless you and lead you, and today you make a big step, but it's just one step. Yeah. So it's many steps ahead of you, and may God lead you and bless you on the way, and if we could anyhow help you, we will be there. Okay, thank you very much. Sister Roda, God bless you, and it's a real privilege that you are new members, and uh, both of you, we will pray for you, and uh, try to help you whenever you can, and uh, we have to work together and ask for God to bless us and lead us up the way. And we will also give you flowers as sign of our or a tribute of our affection. So then would you like to be presented? Yeah. Dear you Older know, Roda, we are really happy and we don't need to emphasize how long the moment it is for us. For me it's very emotional and uh, uh, we wish that you keep promise you gave in front of many witnesses in front of God. May God help you, both of you, God the business to you. Well, uh, I know you for a few years, and uh, uh, you have impressed me 
as well in the summit school uh, with the youth, and you're such a good example. And your family are proud of you. Maybe they can't say it uh, publicly, but you have made them happy. So keep up the good work and the missionary work and the counseling work. God bless you. Amen. So thank you, brethren. Uh, you can take the seat and enjoy the fellowship in our church. Thank you.